Hello folks, welcome back. This is the final lecture of EDU 316-005. It's been really quick, I understand. The seven week courses, this is my first time teaching the seven week courses during the semester. Usually I teach sprint courses in the summer and actually in person. So this is my first time doing the online course, the accelerated online course. So it was, it was very fast for me too. I realized that I still have gotten some things to that I need to post, but we are wrapping it up. So I see that everybody has found their groups and is wrapping up the final project that's due soon. I do just need one PowerPoint per group. And so hopefully everybody's pulling that together. And if you stand on track, you just have a few assignments left. I am going to post one more quiz here soon. And it may be kind of a comprehensive quiz. Well, comprehensive is a strong word. I may bring in some other chapters. I will try to indicate which chapters I want you to highlight. It will be just review. And it's going to be worth a little bit more than 10 points. And so, and then which means I'll give you more time for the quiz. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to be really trying to get my act together and pull, pull it together here soon. So let's, at the interest of time, let's move forward. So this chapter is designed just to help you pull everything together. I know from the concepts, I see that folks are having a really, really hard time with some of the concepts, particularly about race. In the United States, as I said before, at the risk of sounding redundant, when we talk about race, we're accustomed to talk about it from the black perspective and from a person of color. So every time we think about race, we put the burden on people of color. And usually European Americans will say often, not everybody, many people understand, but often we get resistance because we use terms like whiteness and, and white supremacy and the legacy of white supremacy and white power and things like that coming from the white perspective. That makes people uncomfortable because we're not accustomed to talking about race in terms of whiteness. So a lot of people, get, we get resistance from that. Even from religious groups that talk about unity and love, they will say, well, if people of color stop talking about race, it will go away. And also they are being divisive. However, if you are an individual that's actually going through racial trauma, it's very difficult for you to say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about race. I just see color. I can't really say that as an African-American professor. And when I get pulled over by the police or when I experience discrimination sometime every day, I'm not going to say every single day because of where I live, but I do. And then my sexual economic status, but I will say many of the poor. And when I was poor, when I was homeless, when I was going through things, I experienced racism on an everyday basis going in for job applications, even the passive aggressive kind of racism. And so it was difficult for me. It's difficult for me to say, I don't see color. Okay. Let me move forward. We're putting it all together. It's pretty self explanatory. We're going to go into some in-depth discussion here in this last chapter. So what now, where do we go from here? And that's kind of has to do with the opening remarks I made. What, what is our next step? Now that we have all these tools, and this was an intense class and really covered some intense topics. So where do we go from here? And that's what I want you to be thinking about. This kind of, kind of a culminating talk, culminating experience. What does it mean to put critical social justice into action? And so Zerillo, excuse me, that's another author I use, Sensoi and D'Angelo gives us four points to think about. We should now begin to understand that social justice involves recognizing that relationships of unequal social power are constantly being negotiated at both the micro, which is the individual level, and the macro, which is the structural level. So often we, as we have said before, when we think about racism, we are accustomed to looking at it from the individual level. That is, one would say, I've never been involved with slavery. I've never been involved with the civil rights movement. Those were our ancestors. I am not a part of the white supremacist groups that are going on across the country. I am not a part of the hate. I've never 
discriminated against anybody willfully and maliciously. So therefore, I am not a racist. That is looking at it from an individual level. One of the things you should at least take away from this class, even if you're resistant, is that there are things going on on the structural level. Remember we talked about the different applications using the black sounding names and the, the scientific study? That's actual research, so you can't dismiss it. That says time and time again, folks would not hire persons of color because of their names. Think about that. Think about that. If your name is, I have cousins named Tonisha, Jarrell, Maurice, Tyrone Jenkins. These are my cousins. And when people, Alundra, that's my wife's name. When people see that often, they'll assume this is a black person. They automatically put up a defense in terms of hiring that person. There is an assumption, an underlying assumption that these individuals do not know what they're talking about, that they're unqualified because of the color of their skin. They're somehow, quote, ghetto and from those neighborhoods, and they have not got a proper education. This is an ugly, an ugly stereotype. This is an ugly stereotype. Okay, point, point two, we must understand our own positions in relationships of unequal power. If, you, if we are not willing to look at our own self, we're always looking at someone else and pointing a finger, then we are going to struggle, okay? We're going to struggle. And I'm, I'm going to say some of these things again in a different way, but we have to look at ourselves. Even myself as Dr. Childs, a male, I have to look at my own male privilege. Socioeconomically, I have to look at my own privilege. But at the same time, I see what it's like being an African-American in this world, in, in, a, in a Eurocentric world that favors folks of European descent. I know that's difficult to accept, but it is true. It's a reality. And listen, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. You can vote for whoever you want to. You can vote for whoever you want to. But this class is challenging you to think about the policies that favor the rich, for example, and disenfranchise the poor. Number three, we must be able to critically think about knowledge, the nature of knowledge and where knowledge comes from. And we'll get into that a little bit more. We must be able to act from this understanding. So nothing is important. Nothing really is worth doing without action or worth saying without action. And then I just put a, a graphic there lead about leadership, culture, equality, justice, equity, empowerment. Take a look at those phrases. These are phrases that we have been dealing with all semester. Hegemony, fairness, what is fairness? Okay, let's move on. So this is that first point. So you see the scale there in terms of gender equality. Uh, um, you see, the, or, or properly, sex equality. You see properly the male, the, 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 the female takes the burden and is lifting up the plight of the male. So in other words, this is about privilege. Just a graphic I wanted to include. Okay, so recognize how relationships, relations of unequal power are constantly being negotiated. Constantly being negotiated. So look at the narrative on page 200. So if you remember taking a look at that, there are, and it said, I'll just read it. A class, imagine a classroom of 20 teacher education students. In this class, there are 17 female students and three males. This is page 200 under Imagine. The female students are early childhood or elementary education majors, and the male students are all secondary education majors. 17 of the students come from a middle class suburban background, two from a working class and rural background, one from a working class urban background. The students' ages range from 19 to 25. All of them are white. Two of the students have learning disabilities. None of them have visible disabilities. English is their first language. The professor, a white woman, points out that much like the demographic of teachers and teacher education, the class is not very diverse. Many of the students feeling defensive argue that there is a great deal of diversity among them. Think about that. 
Think about that. The book challenges our notion of diversity. And so I'm going to be very frank. Okay, so how white people look at diversity is different from how black folks or persons of color look at diversity. So I grew up in the inner city, but at some point we moved to a lower middle class suburban school where you had working class, you had a lot of poor whites, you had working class, you had lower class, predominantly white, and you had a sprinkling of diversity. And so I would be in a class often with either I was the only African American in class or I had two or three others, not even three, maybe one other African American in my class. And my colleagues, my fellow classmates would say, our school is becoming increasingly diverse. For me, if I'm the only one in the classroom, that's not very diverse. Even at NKU, I'm the only African American in my department. And then with, I'm the only African American in the history of the department with tenure that was promoted to the level of associate professor. And one might say, and I've heard it in meetings, our department is becoming more diverse. Not really, okay? And then generally, when European folks, not as a blanket state, but many often hear they'll say, well, there's different kinds of diversity. You know, there's economic diversity, there's uh, women and men, and you could say that, but often that dilutes the conversation. Seeing diversity through a lens of individualism and personalities is often common during these kind of conversations. But we must look at the students looking through the lens of individualism see diversity in terms of personality. From this lens, everyone is first and foremost a unique individual and social group membership is unimportant. So in this way, an individual that's from the majority race will say, well, people, everybody's an individual, everybody's different. But often from an African-American standpoint, I just say that because I'm African-American, I can, I can speak, not for everybody, but I speak for myself. Um, it's, we're seen as a group. Seeing diversity through a social justice lens involves seeing in terms of social groups. That is, how are social groups treated systematically or systematically oppressed as a social group? So in, in that same way, when a police officer sees me, not every police officer, okay, when they see me, they, see a, a, they might see a criminal. Why do you say that, Dr. Charles? Because I have been pulled over. I was just recently... A month or so ago, I was driving in the car. Well, it's been a little bit over a month now with a friend of mine, a very professional guy. And we were pulled over, and the police stopped us because they thought we were buying drugs. It was obvious. We weren't speeding. They pulled us over. And so that's grouping us together. And then looking at the statistics of apartments, rentals, and jobs, and looking at discrimination that way, so now we're thinking about it from a societal level because many people say, well, I work for everything I have. Many, many middle class European American or even lower class European Americans will say, I, I work for everything I have. I treat everybody the same. Again, that's looking at everything from an individual level. I challenge you if you want to do this kind of work and understand relationships in society, look at it from a perspective of social groups. But at the same time, we, we can appreciate individualism. We are responsible for our own actions, but at the same time, look at how society affects different groups. Think about this. Why do many students become offensive and argumentative when these topics come up? Why do you become offensive and argumentative when these topics come up? I want you to think about that and challenge yourself. Let's move on. So the second one, understand our own position within relations of unequal power. So there's another narrative. I like this particular chapter because it gives us these really good narratives to think about things. Here's another. I'll read it. I'll read again on page two. The bottom of page 203, it starts with imagine. So go ahead and find that. 
A workplace meeting with 14 people sitting around the table, only three in the meeting are men, and all of these men are white. Of the rest of the group of women, three are women of color. A white woman is chairing the meeting and opens the discussion by asking for suggestions for addressing a problem the group is working on. One of the men makes the first suggestion. Without waiting for other suggestions to be brought to the table, a second man rebuts the first man's suggestion. They begin a back-and-forth exchange that goes at length. Every now and then, one of the women asks a question for clarification. One of the men occasionally prefaces his comments with, I know I've been talking a lot, but then continues to talk. Eventually, they wrap up. Their, deba their debate and woman of color makes the suggestion. Let me say that again. I'm saying that wrong. He then continues to talk. Eventually, they wrap up the debate, and a woman of color makes the next suggestion. As soon as she begins speaking, one of the men checks his email, and another gets up to refill his coffee. Let's take a look at that dynamic, the dynamics of the meeting. Let's look at it through a critical social justice lens. The first task is to identify the most salient group. And salient here means the most important or notable groups in the room. What are the salient groups, memberships that are at play in the meeting? Once we've identified them, we can begin to notice the patterns these groups bring and how they might be manifesting in ways that reinforce rather than interrupt inequitable outcomes. Then we can decide what actions we would, would be most constructive for each player. And so I just want you to make some observations here. What's the most salient group or the most notable and important or the group that has the most power? Of course, that's mid, the white males. Now, again, this class is not about let's indict white America. Let's sell white males. They are horrible. People like Tommy Learn and Fox News officials will go on and on about how white folks are going to be in the minority. White folks get picked on. And I feel like I'm being discriminated as a white male. This class is not about that. And if you adopt that position and shut down, then you miss on you, you. You probably haven't done the readings. You probably haven't listened to a lot of the lectures. And you are going to just stubbornly stay in, in your mindset and not try to learn anything. I, I just, but I don't want you to get away with it. I'm saying right now, this class is not about. Let's indict white males. Let's say white males are horrible. You cannot and should not have to apologize for who you are. We promote unity. We want to see people to come together socioeconomically, uh, racially. We want to see folks come together in unity, in mutual understanding. But at the same time, this class is pointing out power relationships, okay? And who has the power who does not? In this case, of course, low person on the totem pole are the women of color. I see this all the time. There was a friend of mine named Shauna. Right after college, I got a job in the corporate world right after undergrad. And I had a friend named Shauna. And we had a, a white male boss. And he was domineering. He would call her Shanene. He would call her Shanene. And he thought it was funny. And her name was Shauna. And she used to feel really bad about it. She was a young woman. And that, that's the type of microaggressions and prejudice that happened every single day. He thought it was hilarious. And others chuckled. Uh, but actually, his wife pulled his coattails. She's like, no, that's inappropriate. So Shauna had to, my friend Shauna had to, to deal with that. And so women of color are often looked at as not intelligent and angry and, and aggressive. And you might say, well, I work with black women all the time, and, and they, they're always angry. I don't know what to say to them. Listen, that's a stereotype. That's that person's individual personality. So in some senses, we are looking at the individual. That's our personality. So I'm not saying we don't look at the individual because we are, I believe, just my framework, my worldview is we all, all are unique. We're snowflakes. We're all snowflakes, not in the sense of the way conservatives <laughs> use it to attack liberals, but I mean, we're snowflakes. We're different. <laughs> We're different because snowflakes have been reappropriated to be a vicious term, actually. Uh, but we're all different. You, you, we're unique, and we appreciate each other. 
And so just because you know a few black women in high school and they were fighting all the time or at your job, you're afraid to say something to them, just because you're afraid of them because of the stereotypes on TV doesn't mean all black women are mean. Okay, let me go forward. It's highly unlikely that any of these patterns are conscious, con- conscious and intentional. In other words, the white, the white males have been walking the room saying, I'm going to oppress these black women. They just are being, quote, who they are, and that's just the way things they are. I'm in charge. You know, they, they have that sense of superiority, but it's not intentional. Just like as a male, when I, I take a leadership position, sometimes I just do that unconsciously. Remember that from a critical social justice perspective, intentions are not as relevant as impact. In other words, just because you didn't intend to be racist doesn't mean you're not racist. So just because you didn't intend to be sexist doesn't mean you're not. And I, if I'm unintentionally sexist myself as a male, that doesn't give me, get me off the hook. I have to realize my impact. And so patterns accrue collectively at the group level as a result of socialization. We're socialized to look at women as in an inferior way. And even from a religious standpoint, if, if one is saying that, that the male is the head of the household or the, the male is, is the head, that's from a religious perspective, that's not saying that women are lesser or women are subordinate. Okay, so I want you to think about that too. They're not our fault, but we are responsible for becoming aware of them and interrupting them. We, we can't just say, well, that's just the way, I, it's not my fault, that's just the way it is. No, we're responsible for classes like this would help us be aware and, and, and interrupt them. Okay, let me go for Thinking critical about our knowledge. Narrative on meeting demographics from page 207. So here's another one I want you to look at. Okay, and I'm trying to move through these pretty quickly. So there's a narrative on page 207 at the bottom under Think Critically About Knowledge. You have been practicing your critical social justice literacy by working, and I like this, by working to identify ideology in a range of texts, books in school, news coverage, advertisements, and movies. Over coffee, a friend tells you about an amazingly inspirational movie she saw called Saving Miguel. The plot of the the plot of film revolves around a white family who saves a poor Puerto Rican child from the drug-infested ghetto of a large urban city. Midway in the story, Miguel returns to the barrio, seeking a reunion with his drug-addicted birth mother. As he walks down the street of his old neighborhood, he is surrounded by a gang who try to intimidate him into joining them. He is considering his limited options when the white mother arrives and confronts the gang leaders, who backs down and retreats. The mother whisked Miguel out of the ghetto and back to her safe suburban home. The story highlights the white family's challenges as they adjust to having a Puerto Rican child in their lives. The movie has a happy ending when Miguel wins a spot at a prestigious art school where he will specialize in dance. You might say, well, what's wrong with that story? But you feel a little uncomfortable, so getting back to the story, page 208, top of 208. You feel a little uncomfortable with the stereotypes the film reinforces. You raise this concern by cautioning your friend to remember that this film was written, produced, and directed by white people and told from the white perspective. Therefore, you tell her some of the characteristics and representations of life in the ghetto might be a bit stereotypical. But your friend protests, but it's a true story, quote unquote. She seemed genuinely confused by your suggestions that this story, which found so, which she found so inspirational, could be problematic. After all, she says, it isn't just about the white family. It is about a Puerto Rican kid, quote, unquote, making it. The following considerations can be useful. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm not going to go into super detail. But for one, a central element in this exchange in your friend's belief a central element of this exchange in your friends believe that the story is true. The idea that stories told in the media are true is common. Be they historical accounts of a battle described in a textbook or a movie that was based on a true story. As we described in chapter, as was described in chapter two, one of the key skills in adopting a critical social justice perspective is asking questions about the meaning given in any event. In this example, we should ask, from whose perspective is the story true? That's important. From whose perspective is the story true? 
Are all of the elements true? Or were some of these elements, such as the neighborhood being ruled by a gang or Miguel's mother being an addict, are they true? Were they added to make the story more exciting or quote unquote real, appealing to a mainstream white audience who has come to expect these tropes, a trope uh, these narratives that we hear time and time again throughout movies that may or may not be true? How much was rearranged, added, or subtracted in order to create the dramatic pacing a movie requires? Do these decisions reinforce stereotypes or challenges? Asking questions such as these are important in unpacking the social construction of knowledge. Okay, there we go. We get there. The social construction of knowledge. How is knowledge socially constructed? And so, look at page 209. I really like it. So, well, first they talk about Frank Chin there, and you can read that on your own in figure 12.1. But look at 209. So, the story is a classic narrative of white supremacy. So here we're using white supremacy in a different way than it's commonly used, as we talked about before. It's not necessarily a neo-Nazi hate group, but the dominance of white narrative in society as the best and as normal. The following are some of the key narratives of white supremacy repeated and reinforced. The story is told from the perspective of white people. White people act as saviors of people of color. Children of color are innocent, but the adults of color are morally and criminally corrupt. We see this play out in politics, in the social world, on TV, etc. and so forth. Whites who are willing to save slash help people of color at seemingly great personal costs are notable, are noble and courageous. Individual people of color can overcome their circumstances by but usually only with the help of white people. You get where I'm going with this. Urban spaces and peoples of color living in them are inherently threatening, dangerous, and criminal. All peoples of color are poor, belong to gangs, are addicted to drugs, and are bad parents. Now, get this one. The most dependable route of escaping the quote-unquote inner city is Assimilation into white society becoming, quote unquote, civilized. That's an old narrative that goes back really to colonialism in, in the 18th and 19th century. White people are willing to deal with individual deserving people of color, but whites do not become a part of their community in any meaningful way. White people are willing to deal with individual peoples of color are morally superior to other white people. Let me say this again. White people who are willing to deal with individual people of color are morally superior to other white people. So the one, like for example, Freedom Riders, Aaron Gruel, the movie Freedom Riders, he goes into the inner city, she's so heroic and noble, superwoman, she goes and saves the poor black and brown folk. It's an inspirational movie, but it has that same narrative, and she's somehow more noble than other white folks, because she's, she's put up with the people of color. She survived their world. From whose perspective is the story told? Thinking, good, thinking back to saving Miguel. The value of people of color telling their own story is so important. That was the problem of slavery. Early slave narratives and historical accounts of slavery were told by the slave masters. So think about how skewed that story is going to be. We must challenge the, white, the notion that white people can speak for people of color. It's so interesting. You may not realize this, but many white people feel obligated or liberated or qualified to speak for people of color. And so often when people of color speak up, they're corrected by European Americans about their own lives. They'll say, you're not really oppressed. You're just complaining. That's what I mean. Okay, let's move forward. So how do we combat racism? How do we combat racism? And just briefly, I think this is so interesting. We're doing some really heavy lifting in this chapter. As you can see, this, this stuff is heavy. And I know it's hard to swallow and deal with. So you have active rate, passive racism, active racism. Actually, I want to have those reversed, but that's okay. Active anti-racism and passive anti-racism. So let's talk about active, active racism. 
For active racism, your examples might include telling or encouraging racist jokes, excluding or discriminating against people of color in the workplace, racial profiling, accusing people of color of quote unquote playing the race card when they try to bring up racism. That's active racism. Or you could have the more extreme examples, lynchings, spray painting, hateful slurs on buildings. In my case, when I was young, being jumped by a group of white teenagers because of the color of my skin, or in my uncle's case, he was actually abducted by the Klan and brutalized and sodomized because of the color of his skin. So that's extreme act of racism. But also, I don't want you to get away and escape. Telling the joke is active racism. Passive racism is examples, silence, ignoring incidents and dynamics that you notice, the inequitable funding of schools, lack of interest in learning more about racism, like some people in this class. The, I'm going to say that again. The lack of interest in learning about racism because it doesn't affect you. So you don't have to care about it. Having few, if any, cross-racial relationships, apathy toward, and lack of awareness about it, movements for racial justice, and not, <coughs> not getting involved in anti-racist efforts. So the uh, active anti-racism. So this is the positive part. Might include working to identify internalized racial dominance if you are white. Working to identify internalized racial oppression if you are a person of color. Making sure there are multiple racial perspectives on an issue in a workplace. Joining organizations. Working for racial justice. Seeking out continuing education. But now we come to passive anti-racism. If you were able to come up with any examples, reconsider them from the lens of action. You will likely find that they don't hold up. Anti-racism requires action. In other words, there's no such thing as passive anti-racism. Okay. Getting to the So as we come to the last slide, we talked about we must act in service of a most more just society. And we come together in the spirit of unity. But true unity is looking at the perspective of others. To say, let's ignore race, class, and gender so we can, quote, move on, is not true unity. It's disingenuous when there are women being oppressed around the world, when women are being sexually assaulted around the world on college campuses and people are not coming to their defense or being allies. That's disingenuous. When children of color in my community are starving and being disenfranchised, because of the neighborhood they're living living in, they're, when they're being treated a, a certain way because of the color of their skin in the classroom, and we don't advocate, you call that unity, we have to stand up, okay? So how do we become a more just society? The principles we discuss are meaningless without action. People in dominant positions must become allies. And there's a list of ally examples on page 211. We must validate and support people who are socially or institutionally minoritized in relation to you, regardless of whether you completely agree with or understand where they are coming from. Engaging in continual self-reflection to uncover your socialized privilege and internalized superiority. Working with other members of the dominant group and not positioning yourself as better or more advanced than they are. For example, the need to speak up or speak for people of color or speak up for women. Those are, those are, that's the position of superiority. Or assuming that you know because you're a white male and there's black people in the room, you're automatically smarter than them. That's just racial prejudice. So there's a number of them letting go of control, sharing power when possible, taking risks to build relationships with non minoritized group members, taking responsibility for mistakes. And so I'm going to stop there. This will be the final lecture I do. I am thinking about there's an article that I want you to, that I'm going to post that I want you to respond to. It's on Donald Trump and racism. And you may be a Trump supporter. This is not telling you who not to support him. That's the point of a democracy. You can 
vote for people that you are convicted to vote for. Vote your convictions. But this article is going to th challenge you to think about some of the things that he's doing, okay? All right, so I'm going to post that, and you'll see a post for that. And we're just coming down to a few assignments. And until next time, we will chat later. Have a good day.